This is my household spice shelf. It started as a consolidation of about four and a half households worth of spices and evolved from there. We've occasionally tried to organize them, but it's a deep dark hole that doesn't give up its secrets easily. As a Christmas present to the household, I promised I would finally solve this. Being a corner shelf, however, it has some rather odd dimensions. The opening is only a foot wide, but it goes back 18 inches on the edge and 22 inches in the middle. Plus these bits on the side, that's quite a bit of volume. Of course, we've only been using the lower half of the volume. We couldn't stack them double deep because then how would arms? But what if the spices could be pulled out into the open? Then we could stack them double deep without any problems. I played around with a bunch of ideas, but in the end I settled on some simple sliding racks. There are some commercial products like what I had in mind, but they all have some critical flaws as far as I'm concerned, like only coming in very shallow depths, being rather expensive, and having this acrylic aesthetic. And you know how I feel about plastic, so why not make them myself? Then I could build them to perfectly fill the width and depth to make as full use of the space as possible. This would mean that they had to be mounted perfectly parallel to each other though, with the correct spacing. That would be challenging in the depth of the corner shelf, but not if I first mounted them all to a plate. Then I could do all the metrologically sensitive work where it belongs, in the shop, and just screw the plate down as a single, rigid, transportable coordinate system once it was done. Easy. First, I cut out a cardboard template in the dimensions I was planning for, just to make sure I had measured everything right. With that confirmed, I mocked up a prototype to see how it felt in action. I bought a cheap drawer slide and cut up some wood. It's kind of hideous, yes, but it got the idea across. I learned a couple things from it. The upper deck could be a bit lower without making it too hard to get drawers out of the lower deck. Easy change. And the cheap drawer slide was really wobbly. This was fixed with the simple expedient of buying drawer slides three times as expensive. And look, almost no wobble. Yes, I know, you're not supposed to use side mount drawer slides in this orientation. But under mount slides all have a totally wrong geometry for what I was doing, assuming they're being mounted in the corner of the drawer slot. And the estimates I saw was that using side mounts like this reduces carrying capacity by maybe 50%, which left plenty of margin for an application like this, even with the cheap slides. The holes in the front plate of the prototype were to test how it could be pulled open. There won't be any room for drawer pulls on them due to the close fit with the cabinet door, so they were going to need holes of some kind for fingers to pull on. These simple circles work fine, but I wasn't particularly inspired by the design. My vision was to do something like the bookends I made back in 2019 for the shelves here in the workroom. Books were becoming a bit of a problem in here, so I set out to build a shelving system that used every bit of wall possible. It will hopefully last me at least another decade or so. The bookends show every possible way that three circles can overlap each other in a kind of topological sense, where we only care about full overlap, partial overlap, no overlap. I should have designed them in CAD instead of Inkscape to get a more consistent feel between each one, but otherwise I've been very happy with them. This is where the project stalled out for about a month. The problem was that the end panels had some very specific constraints on where material could be removed. The spaces where the decks and side rails would be attached on the other side had to be left alone. Also, one of the racks had to be double wide to handle larger spice jars. And it couldn't go in the middle because that would only leave room for one and a half racks on either side. So it wouldn't even have basic symmetry. In the end, I decided it would just go to the far left, putting it as far as possible from the cabinet door. This would maximize access to the one rack where only being able to get to one side might be a problem. For the design, I was hoping to do something with Conway's life, being a big cellular automata nerd. But in order to fit a full glider, the holes would have to be too small to fit a finger in easily. I came up with a version with one of the cells larger and everything rounded over to prevent pinch points. I liked it, but that would still leave a big wall of aluminum plate. That seemed a bit coldly industrial for a kitchen, even by my standards. In the end, I gave up on trying to find a mathematically meaningful design and just tried to find one I liked. I started playing with a bunch of circles to maximize the finger pullability. By leaving just these bars for the deck plates and side rails to mount to, it turned that constraint into a nice connective feature running through the four panels. 
happy enough to move into CAD, I kept iterating on the idea. I guess I would call this my Art Nouveau phase. I sent the end plates to get cut from a commercial service, which was actually a lot cheaper than I had feared. This did mean a lot of needle file work to clean up the sides, of course. Made me wish I had a spindle sander for the inside of the finger pulls, but I got by okay with just a drill press. This sure seemed like a simple project going in, but it hid a surprising amount of work. Each end plate had to have the grooves milled in it for the deck plates, and mounting holes drilled through those for screwing them to the deck plates. It also needed four blind holes for the side rails to mount in. All of this was complicated by my Mills DRO dying. Now, it's not a bad thing to get practice at going full old school, but it definitely slowed me down a lot. Since I had designed the racks to make maximal use of cabinet space, none of their widths were convenient sizes of metal stock. So making the deck plates meant not only cutting them to length, but also to width. I ended up using the table saw for a lot of this, and it worked quite well once I was used to it. Still scares me, though. The saw and edges, though much cleaner than if I had used a bandsaw, were cleaned up on the mill and taken to final width. Then the holes for mounting them to the end plates had to be drilled and tapped. My little knee mill can do an awful lot of things, and I love it dearly, but drilling holes in the end of long, narrow pieces is not its forte. I really have to get a horizontal mill someday. The lower deck plates also had to mount to the drawer slides, but I didn't want the hardware visible on the user-facing side. This meant drilling and tapping some very shallow blind holes, and also using some very short screws, under about 0.2 inches. My local hardware stores didn't have any, so I had to cut down longer ones to length. I decided, possibly incorrectly, that the simplest way to do this cleanly and reliably would be to make a grinding fixture. I milled a bit of drill rod to be as thick as I wanted the screws to be long, drilled and tapped a hole through it, and then hardened it. This way I could thread each screw through in turn, grind it down as far as it would go, and remove a screw of the perfect length. Being hardened, the fixture would resist grinding at least well enough to not change shape much over the two dozen I wanted to make. And it worked! I first used an angle grinder, but then realized the belt sander was a lot more controlled. The base plate everything mounted to was just more of the same, but big enough this time that I had to do all the milling directly on the table. I found that the mounting holes in the drawer slides were nowhere near as accurate as the guide which came with them implied. I could place the first one the correct distance from the edge of the plate, but after that it was better to just use a drill bit to find the correct location empirically. But at least drilling and tapping them was a lot simpler, since these holes could go all the way through. I finished off the base plate by cutting away the excess material at the back for clearance with the angled sides of the cabinet. I couldn't resist getting a bit fancy with it on the mill. And with the base plate done, I could do a full assembly and do a test fit in the kitchen, which went swimmingly. There were a couple minor tweaks I had to make, but later that day it was time for assembly. This meant doing final finishing on all the soft aluminum end plates. I got a top bearing chamfering bit for the router, and used that to make the inside of the finger holes a lot nicer to pull on. Then another couple hours of file and sandpaper work, followed by hitting all the flat surfaces with a 120 grit pad on the palm sander. This is a really great way to create a brushed surface that doesn't show fingerprints and hides small scratches pretty well. This was followed by a couple coats of lacquer. This will help protect the surfaces a bit, but also protect everything else from the surfaces. Raw aluminum has a nasty tendency to leave gray streaks when rubbed against things. After screwing the racks together and carefully grinding the stainless steel rails to be the exact right length between the bottoms of the blind holes, they just pop into place. Some did end up a bit loose, but I don't think I'll notice the rattling after they've been loaded up. If so, I'll lock them down with some drops of epoxy or something. And with that, it was done. Time to load it on the bike and take it home. Final installation was just a matter of doing one last test with the racks in place to be sure of overall positioning. Once that was confirmed, the racks were removed and the base plate screwed down to the bottom of the shelf. These were just with little number six screws, mostly only there to prevent things from sliding around. But if someone were to extend all the fully loaded racks, the screws will be a nice extra layer of protection against a very messy tip-over incident. With the rack slotted back in, installation was done almost before it started. All that was left was to load them up with their precious, delicious cargo. We also took the opportunity to eliminate some of the obviously expired jars and consolidate duplicates, including not one, not two, but three redundant jars of basil. 
Turns out we kept buying more because the others couldn't be found. So, yeah. Merry Christmas, household. In channel news, we're quickly approaching 5,000 subscribers here, which is amazing. I'm starting to think about what I should do to celebrate that. Shop tour? Q&A? If you have any ideas, you know where to leave them. I'll have an unrelated video out in about a week, but after that I'm heading out on a cross-country road trip for much of April. I'm going to go see my new nephew for the first time and also do some research at the Smithsonian on the HHMU, the handheld maneuvering unit from the Gemini program. I would love to make a working replica of this thing, but it's very hard to find details about it online. I'm hoping once I'm back I'll be getting videos out a bit more regularly as I finish up projects for this year's open sauce. Assuming I'm accepted as an exhibitor anyway. If not, they'll, they'll just be projects, I guess. Anyway, cheers.